Sure, this is easy. Hair's chromed, eyebrows are trimmed. <clears throat> Actually, I'd rather watch her than <laughs> that. <clears throat> Okay, it's Gary Peterson, G A R Y P E T E R S E N. That's important, the E. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Your own. Uh, and my name is Robert Bauman, and today's date is June 5th of 2014, and we are conducting this interview on the campus of Washington State University, Tri Cities. So, Gary, let's start uh, with the beginning, I guess, of your time <laughs> here. Uh, can you tell us about. Uh, when you came to Hanford and Tri-Cities, what brought you here? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> okay. Uh, actually, I came first in uh, 1960, January 1960, uh, with the Nike Ajax missile site at the top of Rattlesnake Mountain. And I was temporarily assigned up there. Well, I was assigned up there, but three times a, a day we would get on the back of a two-and-a-half-ton truck and go down to the mess hall down below, and I knew I was going to die, so I asked to be transferred to any place, and I got sent to Korea. Said I'd never come back to the Tri-Cities, but as you can see, I did. So the second time, though, is probably the one year after. Uh, I decided after the military that I needed to get an education, so I went to Washington State University and got a communications degree with a minor in, in uh, electrical engineering. And I had a job with Ford Motor Company all lined up, but I wasn't too enthused about going to Detroit. That was January of 1965. And so my college professor, Chuck Cole, said, gee, there's a new company opening up in Tri-Cities. Why don't you stop by? So I stopped by on a Friday, went to work on Monday with Battelle, which became Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. So there's how I got here. <laughs> So that first time in 1960, uh, why did you want to transfer? Was it the, the, the ride down the mountain? Three times a day with an 18-year-old driving, you know, you drop 2,000 feet and at the bottom there's a 90-degree corner, 16-degree grade, and I just, it was January, and I knew that uh, one of these was going to go off the road. So I said, I've, I've got to get out of here. So I put in a request for transfer and I transferred, just like that, to Korea. <laughs> uh, did you, during that first time here in 1960, did you spend any time in town? We, we did, much different then. Uh, actually, most of the servicemen, and there were quite a few of us at the four batteries, uh, would go to, uh, there was a bowling uh, alley and a dance hall over in Kennewick, uh, just off of uh, Clearwater, that was surrounded by fruit trees. Now all of that's gone, and it's all it's all uh, businesses and so on. Clearwater's full, but at that time it was all orchards, so pretty nice. What were your impressions of the place, other than the, not liking that ride down the mountain? Well, it, you have to remember it was about like probably what uh, uh, the first military people saw when they came by here in December, January, nineteen forty-three. I mean, it was it was cold. It was brown. No trees. Um, you know, it it was a barren place even in 1959. So I can imagine what Colonel Matthias thought when he first flew over this place. Uh, and from the top of Rattlesnake, uh, as you can imagine, you know, you saw the entire Hanford site. So it was it was pretty barren and bleak. So where, uh, going back a little farther, where had you lived before this? Where did you grow up? I graduated from Womack High School, uh, which is up the Okanagan, lived on an apple orchard. Uh, again, I was used to being around trees, and you come to the desert. Uh, I, I can imagine, any time between 1943 and 1959, 60, 61, 62, this was a pretty, pretty barren place. 
And so in 1965, you took the job uh, with Patel. Yep. Uh, what was the job? The, the job to start with was a, was a communications person. I became the manager of, of the news uh, service. And so the advantage I had was I got everywhere on the Hanford site except the tank farms. I've stayed away from the tank farms successfully for a lot of years, but I, I spent a lot of time out at 100F reactor, uh, which was the biology and aquatic biology uh, site at the time. Uh, so I, I got all over the site, including back up to the top of Rattlesnake Mountain a couple of times. So it was, it was pretty nice. Um, so, uh, when you came back then in 65, um, where, did, where did you live? Li lived originally in what were called the stilt apartments. Uh, they're on Jadwin. Uh, they've been fixed up since, so you'd never know that they were stilt. Uh, stilt meaning that they actually had posts that held up the second floor, and the posts were the garage for the people who lived there, but uh, they're not far from the Chevron station, kind of in North Richland. Uh, lived there for quite a while, and then the last of the homes that were built prior to 1958 went for sale. Those are called the Richland Village Homes, and there were two-bedroom and three-bedroom, either one-car garage attached or unattached, and they went up for sale for, I, I bought one, a uh, three-bedroom with a single-car garage attached for 6200 bucks. Pretty good buy at the time. And I ended up paying less than I was for rent in the stilt apartments. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was a pretty good deal. Mm -hmm. What was the uh, community of Richland like at the time in the mid-1960s? The, the community was still just finding its way out of what I called the federal government ownership. Uh, in 1958, the city became an incorporated city again. I mean, it was 1958 that the, the federal government turned the city back over to itself. And so between 58 and 65, uh, it was a city that was still trying to find its way as a city, other than as a federal uh, funded city. And so it was, it was unique in that aspect. Battelle was one of the first companies, too, to come in here. Although it had a government contract, it was one of the few to come in here and be from the outside. Man, up until that point, it was DuPont and then General Electric. And in 1965 is when the AEC decided to diversify the Hanford uh, uh, contract. And they split it up into eight pieces. And so Battelle was one of those pieces. Uh, the others were HEHF and, and uh, the operations and so on. So there's been 35 contractors in here since 1965. And Battelle was one of the early ones. So now, before your your first arrival here in uh, 1960, the Ajax uh, site, mm -hmm. um, did, were you familiar with Hanford? Did you know sort of work that was going on in Hanford? Well, I I did only because I spent some time up at Fairchild Air Force Base. They also had a Nike Ajax missile site, and so they were trying to transfer some people from Fairchild to Hanford. And so I learned a little bit about what Hanford was. The nice thing at the time is everybody, all the military guys says, oh, you're going to love the Tri-Cities because it's way warmer than Spokane. And so I thought, sure. And then you come down in January and <laughs> it was cold. Uh, I mean, it, you know, top of Rattlesnake, you get winds up to 100 miles an hour. I mean, it was uh, not one of your pleasure spots at the time. So, but the view was great. It was great. So you, you knew something about Hanford at that point? Knew, knew that it was a military installation, federal installation, knew that they made the material for the atomic bomb, knew that there was a reason for the Nike Ajax muscle site uh, to be there to protect the site. So yes, that, that much we were pretty clear on. And the military took their job very seriously. I mean, there was a no-fly zone over Hanford. Uh, no commercial flights, no, no flights of any kind other than military itself. So it was, it was pretty well protected. And on top of Rattlesnake, I might just add, that was the, mis that was the uh, radar installation, and it was at the highest point, so the radar reached a long way. And you could see planes coming uh, well, well in advance of them ever getting to, to Hanford. 
And what was interesting is sometimes we would notify Fairchild or McCord, and you'd actually have you know, uh, fighter jets intercept planes that wouldn't veer off. And so that was a unique feature of what you did on top of the mountain. The other sites, they had radar installations, but that one was, that one was pretty unique. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty good. Yeah. Good times. Uh, so in 1965, when you came and you're working in communications, what yep. sorts of responsibilities did you have? Well, one of the assignments that was unique was to uh, take tours to indoctrinate all new staff members, and that was for everywhere on the site. So, so over the years, I've taken ex literally thousands of people on tours of the site, and, and at the time, it didn't seem like it was that great of a job to be able to take people around the site, explain what the reactors were, what the 100 area, 200 area, 300 area, those kind of things. But as it turned out, the, the longer I did it, the more I realized that the, the work that was going on here was critical. I mean, the Cold War was still fairly active. Uh, and so, you know, it became, it became important to me to make sure that people understood what kinds of things went on here. It wasn't until later that I became interested in what happened pre-1943. Uh, as, as you keep tromping across the land, you start saying, oh, there were other things here too. So... But it was pretty good. So those site tours for new employees, uh, did, did, were they able to go pretty much everywhere on site? We could, we could go everywhere except into uh, the area that had the plutonium, which is now known as the plutonium finishing plant. I mean, where there was, there was restricted classified. The, the, the real concern was both tritium and plutonium. You couldn't say the word tritium back in those days. You could plutonium because they knew that the material for the for the plutonium bomb, uh, Fat Man, came from here. But but tritium was something nobody talked about, and so you know those areas were restricted, and that was mostly in the tank farm area. I mean it, that was where chemical separations took place. So we stayed away from those. It's okay by me. Well, that does raise the, the, obviously uh, security. Uh, safety were very important uh, in Hanford. Um, in what ways did security at Hanford impact your job? I mean, that's obviously one way. There's certain areas you couldn't go, right? You know, there, were, there were places you couldn't go. The badges, all of the badges at that time were designated to which areas you could or couldn't go. And so it was, it was readily identifiable on your badge whether you were allowed into say the 300 area or the 100 areas with reactors or the 200 area and within them there were other exclusion zones too so there were there were restrictions placed in each of those locations and typically somebody that worked in the 100 area wouldn't ever be allowed into the 300 area or into the 200 areas so the reactor areas were the 100 area the 300 area was the research area and the 200 area was chemical separation. So it's, I mean, they were pretty segregated as to where you could go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, in communications, you, you mentioned uh, that you couldn't say the word tritium. Or, you know, were there other things you couldn't talk about or, or write about? You, you couldn't talk about quantities. As a matter of fact, there was a real restriction early on. The, one of the things that I found that in the process of working in communication. There were nine production reactors around the Columbia River on the Horn. And in the summertime in particular, they, there were periods where all nine reactors would be working. Uh, it sounds unique when you think about it today. But in the summertime, June, July, August, they actually measured the temperature of the Columbia River before the first reactor and after the last reactor. And if the, as I recall, if the Columbia River temperature was raised by uh, close to 10 degrees, then they would have to start shutting down the reactors because the flow back into the Columbia River was that warm coming from the reactors. So in order to protect the fish and things in the river, then you know they, they really monitored the river very carefully. So. And the reason I point that out is you also never talked about how much water went through those reactors because it was a fear that the Soviet Union could figure out the quantities of production simply by measuring the amount of water that went through those reactors or the temperature increase from one point to another. That, I mean, it sounds odd today, but that was one of the, 
strictures of what you could and couldn't talk about. So it was it was a pretty quick. I mean, they they were very careful about quantities. So. And I assume that you had to when you were hired had to go through security clearance yeah. process. Q, Q clearances were standard. Uh, there was one level above that that was called a crypto for a while. Uh, don't know what happened to those, but that was for individuals who got around most of the site, and so they were they were a unique feature at that time. So yeah. So where was your office located? When did you look at it? Uh, well, um, my office moved all over. Uh, originally, it was in the old Army headquarters, and, and this is in 1965. Battelle, when they first came in here, moved into a building that was called 3201. Later, they changed it to the old office building, OSB. Old OSB was what it was called, old office building. But that was before the Battelle buildings were built, which became known as the Sandcastle. Uh, and so we lived, lived and worked from January of 1965 until probably the spring of 66 before we moved into the new Battelle buildings, Battelle-owned buildings, the Sandcastle, which are there on Battelle Boulevard now. And, and then later I moved out in the 300 area. I was in and out of the 100F area. I mean, those, those kind of places. So, yeah. How are we you, doing? You knew the site well. You just well, <laughs> knew, except, except for the 200 area. I mean, that, that was a real restricted area. and right. maintained that for quite a number of years. So you talked about giving tours uh, to new employees, mm -hmm. for sort of indoctrination to the site. Um, how about for dignitaries, uh, gov you know, government officials? You did that, and, and how about the general public? General public, rarely, if never. I mean, I, I don't think we ever did that. But government official Catherine May was the first congresswoman I took through. Uh, she was a congresswoman from the eighth district, uh, and I took uh, Senator Magnuson through. Uh, later, Tom Foley. Uh, so, quite a number of those over the years. And later years, we started getting some foreign visitors as well. But early years, congressional offices, congressional staff, um, uh, the governor. Uh, and so, uh, Dan, governor, now my name just flew out of my head, uh, the governor of the state of Washington, Dan. Evans. Evans and he he late thank you he he later became uh, also a senator from the state. Uh, he was the first governor that that I helped escort across the site. So most of those it was it was unique to be able to take visitors like that around the area. Do any of those uh, tours especially stand out? Were any officials like particularly interested or excited about it or? or any sort of strange uh, <laughs> well, stories from that? Well, Sen Senator Magnuson was a unique individual, and he actually came out uh, quite a number of times. And one of those times, we were in the 300 area, and I was working at the time for Westinghouse, Westinghouse Hanford Company. And, and he came out to actually, quote, break the ground on FFTF. And we were in a, in a building at the time, the four-story office building, in the 300 area, and and uh, I'll never forget. I was assigned to make sure he got up to the podium, and and his his vehicle came in front of the building, and then drove around to the back of the building. So I ran back and met Magnuson back there. I'd known him before, and frankly, honestly, he was drunk as a skunk, and so I didn't think that he was going to be able to make it. And he says, "Just get me to the podium, and I'll be fine." I didn't think it was possible, but he got up, he gave an excellent speech, uh, you know, a little wobbly, but I don't think most people knew that he had been drinking. Uh, this was four o'clock in the afternoon or so, and so then he left. Uh, might point out, it was, about, it was about a year later, 1971, that President Nixon came out. And so uh, there, was, there was quite a scramble because at that time there were no buildings for Westinghouse. Westinghouse is kind of spread all over. So when the advance team for Nixon came out, they decided that the proper place would be the Patel buildings. <laughs> and this sounds odd, but there was, there was a real uh, infighting between, at that time, Atomic Energy Commission, Westinghouse Hanford Company, and Battelle over what signs would be displayed where. 
because Westinghouse was interested in making sure this was for FFTF, and that was a Westinghouse project. And so, I mean, on the front of the podium, of course, was the president's seal, and he spoke out in front of the buildings. But behind that, or around that, Westinghouse came in the night before and put up Westinghouse Circle W signs around the site. And so just an example is my boss at the time, who was one of the vice presidents, said, I don't care how you do it, but I want a sign that says Battelle that they can't take down and will be located uh, visibly for all the cameras. So he stole a door off of one of the uh, one of the rooms in the in the Battelle building. I don't know if you've been in the buildings or not, but they're very tall doors. They're nine foot tall doors. So we actually that night took one of the doors off, put Battelle on it, and put it up on the front of the building up high, so it was right behind the podium. And Westinghouse, I mean, we had to do that after midnight. So and that that door actually was at the entrance to Battelle for I don't know the next twenty years. They finally took it down a, not long ago, but. That was relative to President Nixon showing up. So it was, it was pretty good. Feeling <laughs> a moving door. Well, it, everybody wanted their, their name in with the President of the United States, and so, so that's what we did. Did you, did you get the chance to meet him? I did. Uh, one of the things that I still really value, my family still values, is Pat Nixon was along with him, and my oldest daughter was one year old. And so, because of what I was doing, we managed to get my wife and daughter into what was called the VIP area of, of the presentation and so on. So, she didn't get to shake hands with President Nixon, but Pat Nixon came by and actually held my daughter for a brief minute. We got a picture of it and it was still in the family someplace. Yeah. <coughs> um. How about foreign dignitaries? Any, uh... For, foreign dignitaries, those, those came later too, after the SALT agreements. Uh, on the signing of the SALT agreements, there was real concern both on the part of Russia, Soviet Union, and the United States for how much material was still being made or not made. And so there were a number of Russian visitors who came over to verify which reactors were still operating, which ones weren't. Uh, how much material was still going through the canyon facilities, those kind of things. And so we started for the first time seeing some of the senior Russian officials come through. Uh, the one that still strikes me in, in my memory is, is Admiral Sarkisov. And he was head of the Russian Navy. And so he came out both to see, at that point, the start of the of the reactor vessels from the submarines. We, today we have about 124 submarine and cruiser missile reactor cores out on site. But at that point, I wanna say we probably only had eight or 10, maybe 11, 12, something like that. But he also wanted to see those and verify that the submarines had actually been decommissioned, cut up, and so on. And so, so we toured both the reactor areas and the submarine vessel area uh, and, of course, that's where my story about FMEF comes from, too. I mean, there was a building out there that was built for FFTF called FMEF, Fuel Material Examination Facility. On the way out to the site, Admiral Sarkisov asked, what is in that building? And I told him it was a shutdown building. We went out and toured the site. We toured the top of Rattlesnake Mountain with him, too, which was pretty unique. But we toured the site, and coming back in, he asked if he could see that building inside the building, and so I called security. It was a closed building, it was locked up. Uh, and so they met us and they let us in. As we came out, Admiral Sarkisov says, well, now I can move the satellite. And I asked what he was talking about, and he said, well, we've been watching that building since it was completed, and we couldn't believe the United States would build a building of that size, that massive size, and then not use it. So we knew that it was connected underground some other place because we never saw any cars come. And so the Russians actually thought that that building was so secret that they had an underground entrance that came from someplace else. But he saw it was simply not used. And it is a unique building. I mean, it's a, you know, a billion dollar building, so, yeah. That's a great story. Um, so 
when we were giving the tour with him, was there an interpreter present? Who was there? Always an interpreter. As a matter of fact, one from both State Department for for us, for the people who were the escorts, and then he had his interpreters too. So there was there was both. I mean, the the group was probably ten ten people or so. Site manager, uh, and then others of that. I mean, there was. People from state, you, you didn't let them wander around by themselves. Mm-hmm. So pretty unique. Right. Yeah. Um, <coughs> well, you said you know, you, you've been uh, connected to Hanford since 1965. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm sure you've Almost 50 years. a lot of interesting events and stories. Uh, so I'm going to ha- ask you to tell me some of those. But there's one in particular I know, uh, and that's the alligator story. Yeah, the alligator story is good. The the alligators uh, pretty unique. The the aquatic biology was located in a hundred F area. That's the last reactor in the downstream flow of the Columbia. So so they studied the impacts of the reactors on fish, uh, miniature swine, uh, beagle dogs. They had all kind of yeah, pygmy African pygmy goats. But but one of the uh, Mert Gillis was a doctor of veterinary medicine graduate of WSU, I might add, mm-hmm. and, and he uh, said that he wanted to study the uptake of strontium-90 in a thick-skinned animal because strontium is a bone seeker or thick skin. So he convinced the, the manager of the site, uh, of biology site, that we ought to buy some alligators. And so the story varies depending on who you're talking to. Uh, Bill Bear will give you one side of the story because he was one of the managers out there. I'll give you another one. Uh, but I know for a fact that at least six alligators were purchased uh, for the study of strontium-90 uptake. Uh, Bill Bear says there were more, but, uh, but I, still, I still wonder about that because I was in and out of there a lot. Uh, but these alligators were about, about two and a half feet long. And so they put them in a retention pen in the Columbia River, but, but it was also where the, the effluent from the F reactor came back, the, the water. The water had passed through the reactor, put into a retention basin for a short period, and then put back in the river. So it was warmer than the river. I mean, that's, that's part of the point. And so it also was the first place where the water returned to the river, and so that was where the strontium would be taken up by the alligators. That's the theory. Well, two months, three months after they put the alligators into this retention uh, pond, there was a big storm. Uh, the, the pin came down and all six alligators got out. So they managed, this was under the AEC at the time too. They managed to catch five, but they missed one. And it was months later that a fisherman over in Ringgold downstream fishing caught this last alligator. And of course he was trying to tell his friends about it and on and on. But he, he had to protect the proof so he took it to a taxidermist office in Pasco and had the thing stuffed. Well, one of the technicians from aquatic biology was walking by the taxidermist shop, saw this stuffed alligator. So he, he ran in, grabbed the alligator and ran out, which now makes it more or less of a public story. And so, and this was in 1963, before I got here. But, but the story comes around. Uh, anyway, so, so AEC tried to bury that story. No, we've never had an alligator out there. We don't know anything about alligators. I mean, they, they actually, I think, had it classified for quite some time. But when I got here in 65, my boss was a guy named George Dalen, and I had been here for about a year, and he says, it's time to give the alligator back. I had no idea what he was talking about, this, but this is where I entered the story. So, so he had pulls out this stuffed alligator about like this, and he said it was, I think the guy's name was Aaron. He said, track him down because he was a fisherman. He paid to have it stuffed, and we're going to give the alligator back, and we'll just kind of let the story go away. And so I did. I found the man. Unfortunately, the Tri-City Herald ran a story about this big, about the alligator. And once every eight or ten years, they use one of these clips. You know, they do the previous in history. And so so DOE came in and they 
claim to know nothing about any alligators ever, ever, ever. And so it was in the technical library that they finally found the documents that showed not only did they have alligators, but the other five, they moved from 100F when they had a fire out there down to the 300 area where, where Life Sciences built a new building. So, so I know that there were six alligators, five, but one stuff. And Bill Bear says there were a few more than that, but, but I don't know that. So that's the alligator story. And better told over beer, I might add. <laughs> but, yeah, but not bad. <clears throat> Um, are there any other uh, stories uh, you know, during your time in Hanford, either incidents, events, things that you were involved in, uh, either in your job, in yep. Jason County? The, the biggest one is one that I think this community has forgotten completely, and that's Apollo 11. Apollo 11 was the first lunar landing, uh, and when Apollo 11 came back from the moon and splashed down in the Pacific, it turned out that in 329 building, there was a room that was used for very low level radiation detection. It was a room made of pre-World War II battleship steel. And it, it was used for a lot of reasons for measuring very small quantities of radiation. And so, so Battelle actually put in a bid with NASA to study those first, some of the first lunar materials that came back. So they had splashdown in the Pacific, and we had a man named Dr. Lou Rancitelli who actually waited in Houston for those materials to be flown from the Pacific off of the aircraft carrier back to Houston. And then he had a, he had a briefcase, big briefcase, uh, chained to his wrist where he brought those back through Seattle and then to the Hanford site. He arrived here about one in the morning, I might, might add. And there were only, there were only a few people, uh, uh, Dr. Perkins, myself, uh, a couple others who were waiting. I mean, we, we kept this all secret because we weren't supposed to tell news media or anybody else that this was going on. Uh, but, but Lou got the materials back, and the next day we started petitioning uh, NASA to allow us to display those moon rocks here in this community. And so the second place in the whole world that moon rocks were displayed was the Federal Building here in Richland. And we managed to display them for three days. And there were lines four abreast around the Federal Building to look at those rocks. And almost to a person, they'd go by and ooh and ah because it came from the moon. But almost to a person, everybody says, looks just about exactly like what we see out here in the desert. <laughs> and so you couldn't, you couldn't tell them apart. But, but the fact that we had those lunar materials, I mean, that was a, wherever you were, you watched TV of the landing on the moon in 1969, you know, and so that was, a, that was a huge event. I mean, it was after that that Nixon came to town, uh, and so, but hardly anybody recalls that at all. I mean, it's just a forgotten piece of history, but at the time, it was pretty big. It was pretty big. It, it was, Almost, and I missed it, it was almost like when President Kennedy came out to dedicate the Hanford Generating Project attached in reactor, and that happened 1963, just, just before I got here. Mm -hmm. So, but big events. Yeah, yeah. Um, any, any other happenings or stories that kind of stand out in your mind? The, the, uh, I, I wasn't a part of what was called the Green Run. Others will have to tell you about the Green Run. But one of the stories I covered, and it's one of the only ones that I was out in near the tank farms, uh, Atmospheric Sciences is out between the 200 East and the 200 West. And it has a 300 foot tall atmospheric tower at that site. And they've all been removed today, but going downwind, from that 300 foot tall tower were number one, four or five 200 foot tall towers and then five or six or seven 100 foot tall towers. And they would regularly release very small quantities of radioactive iodine, most usually put into uh, colored smoke so they could track both the visual as well as the radiation and see how long it took to go downwind and disperse. Uh, just to show you how we were at the time, uh, the photographer and I who were covering that piece of the story thought, well, not only did we want to shoot it so you could see it go, but get underneath it 
so, so you can watch it as it, I mean, it's not a very smart thing to do today, but at the time it seemed like a pretty good idea to be able to watch that stuff as it drifted and, and deposited. So uh, we did the story. Uh, AEC never let us release it, uh, but we kept the story internally for quite a number of years, and I don't, I don't know what happened to it now. Mm -hmm. But those kind of things went on fairly often. I mean, you, you need to know where radiation goes, and, and that was a piece of it. So. Uh, roughly the time period that would have been? Well, it would have been 60, probably 68, mm -hmm. 68 or 69, uh, someplace in there. The, there has been more study on the Hanford site, atmospheric studies, uh, geologic studies, uh, temperature swings, those kind of things, than almost, almost anywhere in the United States. I mean, they, they really tracked how the, how the weather changed, how the wind moved, what the ground uh, flow is from from rain, those kind of things. I mean, it was going to atmospheric physics in a lab in the 200 area was an experience. Uh, so, at, at one point, I managed to take a TV crew up because you climb a 300 foot tall tower in the middle of Hanford, uh, you could see just about everything. And it turned out that we got the film crew up. They took the pictures, and then security looked at the pictures and said, "No, you have." pictures of classified areas within those pictures, so they took the whole video. So all of the all of the climbing up and down was for not. So it was a pretty good place. You, uh, <coughs> you mentioned earlier that um, you know, when you first came and started giving tours, you really didn't know much about pre-43 residents. True. Uh, when did you become more aware of the communities that were out there and, and, and start learning more uh, about them? I had the real fortunate uh, opportunity to meet uh, Bill Rickard, and I hope you've interviewed him. I mean, Bill, Bill is a gentleman of the first order, but Bill has probably walked that site more than any single person. And so one of the early things, I, I got acquainted with Bill. Bill ended up taking me on walks across parts of Hanford. The first time that he took me out was to Rattlesnake Springs which is up a gully on the face of Rattlesnake Mountain. Uh, and you know, it, it, it's just an experience to go with Bill. And that was mostly on, we call it bugs and bunnies, but it was mostly, you know, what was the, you know, all of uh, nature that's out there. Deer, elk, uh, coyotes, you know, even fish and so on. But Bill, Bill knew that, knows that site probably better than any other single person. And so every chance I ever got to go out with Bill anywhere, that's where you first got the sense that there was something here pre-1943. That's when I first saw the irrigation piping. And that's where you first saw the home site. I mean, it, there's we've had two major fires across that site, and both of them ended up taking out things that were still left. I mean, there was a home up by Rattlesnake Springs that actually still had furniture in it. And it was burned down in the first fire. And so, I mean, but Bill knew, Bill knew all of that stuff. And so, you know, the experience of going out with Bill was, was really unique. I wouldn't trade it for anything. I mean, and, and that's where I started thinking, well, actually, Bill led me to a person named uh, Annette, uh, can't think Harford. of it. Hereford. And, and Annette is the one who, she was in the class that would have graduated from Hanford High School out there on site. And so, and she worked for Battelle, PNL at the time. And so I got real acquainted with Annette and then I helped Annette have the first reunion of her class out at that old Hanford school. And that would have been, my gosh, maybe 78 or so. 1977, 78, I mean, and, and Annette could tell stories about what the old uh, Hanford town was like and White Bluffs and how rich of an agricultural area it was. And I mean, she was, she was an amazing lady. It's too bad that she passed away quite, quite some time ago. She was, she was a real historian. But that, you talk to those and all of a sudden it becomes real She's the first one that I talked to, not Bill Rickard, but Annette Hereford, 
that, that explained that some of the people had less than two weeks notice to move off that site. And you, you think about it and you say, that's, that's just not possible. But it happened. And so, you know, you, then you start feeling for the people who, there were roughly 2,000. The numbers change depending, again, on who you talk to. I mean, one, one side, the federal side, says there's only 1,500 people out there. But if you, look at the, if you look at the historical records, you know that there were probably about 2,100 kids and the whole works. And some of the early census didn't include some of the children. So, or, or the sheep herders that moved back and forth across the site. And so it was, you know, and, and talking with Annette, you finally got the feeling there was something else here that happened before 1943. So that, that's, that's what got my attention. Good that you know her name too. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <coughs> so why did you think it was that was important then for people to know about? Well, it, it was it was probably a little later than that that I also became a, acquainted with some of the Native Americans, and 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 I've got to know some of those over time too, and and the relationship of the people who lived out there, both with Native Americans and the site. I'll ch change directions for a minute too. My my family at that point lived in Wenatchee, and so when I first came in 1965, in order to get to Wenatchee from here, you had two choices: you'd either go around through Pasco and up through Moses Lake and back, or you could go out to Vernita where there was a ferry, part time, and it didn't work at night, and you could ride the ferry and go across. Okay, so so and that was prior to the bridge being built and so on. So, so as you go out there and see the ferry, you'd also see the structure that now I know is Bergman Warehouse. And you'd meet some of the people who uh, were either former residents or Native Americans. You know, as, I mean, then you didn't just, you stopped and you waited for the ferry. You know, so you got a chance to talk to some of the people as you went back and forth. And so there was a lot of discussion about what was this site prior to. But going from Bernita to Vantage, that was pre-Mattawa days. And, and now I can visualize what Hanford must have been because Hanford was an agricultural area prior to, I mean, it looked like Mattawa. Today does. I mean, when I first started driving up there, there were no orchards between Vernita and, and Vantage. And so now you look, there's orchards and vineyards and, you know, all kinds of stuff at Mattawa. Well, Hanford was that, but it was that before 1943. And so you, you have to visualize what it was like. And, you know, it's amazing. I mean, Hanford really has a perfect uh, weather pattern for early produce. And it was one of the first in the state to produce, you know, all kinds of things. Peaches and pears and cherries and... Walnuts, all kinds of stuff. So, right. how are we doing? <laughs> uh, These guys need a break. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you started in '65, mm -hmm. um, and you're now at Tridec. Yep. At what point did you move to Tridec? I know you worked also at Westinghouse. And yeah, yeah. I, my my wife kids around and says, I can't hold a job. I mean, that's, that's the point. I, I typically work for a company for about seven years and then move companies. <coughs> so I worked for Battelle for a while, then Westinghouse for a while, then uh, what was called Whoops, Washington Public Power Supply System for a while. Uh, but I retired from Battelle in 2002, and, and the Hanford manager for the site was Sam Volpentest. And Sam was 99 years old at the time, and his doctor, who's also my doctor, ended up saying, Sam, you can't fly to Washington, D.C. anymore and go after money. So I'd known Sam since 65. I met him in 65. And Sam called and said, Gary, I know you retired, but would you come back to work part-time? Ten hours a week, easy job. Go to Washington, D.C. for me, and that's it. Well, he had the nerve to die at 101. So he, he lived for about a year after he hired me to do those trips. And when he, when he passed on, uh, then as a result, Tridec at the time said, 
well, we need somebody full-time to do this, and I wasn't real interested, so they said, we'll make it a part-time job. You only have to work 25, 30 hours a week. Mm -hmm. um, hasn't been that since, so <laughs> so away we go. And, and it's nice, because if they want to fire me, they'll love it. I'll go and play golf. It's a good deal. So, uh, Lee, could you talk about Sam Bolton Test a little bit? Uh, obviously a very important figure yep. in the history of the Tri-Cities. Um, could you talk about about his significance a little bit and, and what he was like. Would be happy. Uh, Sam, Sam was an incredible politician. He never ran for office that I know of, but he, he knew politics from the top to the bottom. He was friends with everybody from Governor Rosalini to Senator Magnuson, Senator Jackson, uh, Speaker of the House Tom Foley. I mean, he, he knew politics. If you read if you read the book that was just written about Sam, uh, it it has a lot of facts. But until you knew Sam, uh, and I was fortunate, another part of my assignment uh, when I first got here in '65, Tridec was called Tricnic, so it would, it had a different name. It was Tri City Nuclear Industrial Council, and Sam was not a writer. And a matter of fact, everything he did was longhand, very pretty penmanship, but he, but he couldn't put things down on a typewriter for taking to Washington, D.C. and so on. So Battelle, one of their offers to the community was to provide somebody who could write to Sam to write their newsletters, to write their uh, congressional letters, to write mm, things. You know, and so I got to know Sam when he was in a little office on the parkway. Later, he moved into the Hanford house. Sam was a mover. I mean, Sam, most of the ideas that Sam accomplished didn't start with Sam, but he would hear an idea, and he'd say, that sounds good. We're going to do that. For example, and, and he started Trick Neck Tridec in 1963. And so in 1963, you've got to go back in time, every road in and out of the community was two lanes. There was one airline only at the time, and Sam, Sam knew that at that 1963, they, the government, AEC, was starting to shut down the reactors. And so Sam and Glenn Lee and Bob Phillip formed Tricknick, and they did that to try and offset, with federal dollars, the coming shutdown of the production mission at Hanford. In the process, they also determined that in order to develop a community long range, you had to have transportation. So even though most people think that Sam concentrated on Hanford, he actually, he and Glenn Lee and Bob Phillip all really focused on how do we make the Tri-Cities bigger and better than it is. And four-lane highway was first, but airlines were second. And the third one that really was not well known at all was education. I mean, they went after a center for graduate study for this community, which became WSU Tri-Cities. I mean, they, they decided that you, ha you had all of this intellectual property at the laboratory and at Hanford, but you needed something for their, their families. And so, I mean, it, it would, it, I don't think it was a sit down and let's do a vision and do all these things. I think it came in pieces where they actually decided they wanted certain things. And sometimes the, the fallout was better than what they expected. Uh, as an example, the Breeder Reactor Program, which, which started in, in 1968, 69, was going to be a major, major new DO, AEC mission. And so Sam went after the, the breeder reactor program, and, and he didn't get it. Savannah River did, uh, what was called Clinch River Breeder Reactor. But he got the secondary issue, which was FFTF, which is a small test reactor that led to. And as it turns out, over time, the administration killed the Clinch River Breeder Reactor, but they kept FFTF going. Or another example is, we lost out on a mission that Sam really wanted that I think was called SMEZ, and maybe I'll explain it, but maybe not. Uh, and we lost that one, too, and so Sam went to Magnuson and said, we need something. Give us something. And so 
couple of days later, the story goes that Magnuson called up and said, well, you know, we had a federal building planned for Montana or Wyoming or something, but they really don't want it. So how about we put a federal building in the Tri-Cities? And that's how this federal building came about. But that was, that was Sam. Sam. Sam was tenacious, and he either liked you or he didn't like you. And, you know, there were people he wouldn't let in his office, period. But others, he, phenomenal memory. I mean, he could pick up a phone and, and call congressmen or senators from other states without ever looking the number up. I mean, he would pick up the phone. He never believed in talking to staff. He would talk to Senator Magnuson. He would talk to, you know, Chet Half, uh, Hallfield. He would he'd call him up personally and say, I need this or I need that. He was, he was incredible. That's a great story. Uh, how was he able to uh, have such persuasive power with, you know, you, you Magnuson, Scoop Jackson, who was also Tom Foley, like uh, these U.S. senators. Tri-Cities was not, was still fairly small population-wise. No. Uh, was it his tenacity? It, it was his tenacity, but it all started with Governor Rosalini. And the fact that Sam, for a period before he came here, was in the Italian something club in Seattle, which was Rosalini. Uh, Magnuson was an honorary member. Uh, he, belonged, he, Sam, belonged to the Seattle club, which is still there, downtown Seattle. And so he made political, he, he recognized that you needed political connections no matter what. And so when he came here, and then he had the backing of Glenn Lee, Tri-City Herald, uh, the combination of those two, I mean, it, Sam, Sam took every advantage he could find. And so his advantage with the Tri-City Herald was if he thought we needed something, then Glenn Lee would support it editorially, and they would go after the politicians collectively and get it. So it was, I mean, Sam liked to take credit, and he did many, many things, but it was really the combination that he put together that was, was pretty, yeah, pretty unique partnerships. And, and it took him a long time to play what I call both sides of the aisle. Uh, typically, he was a Democrat. He was a solid, solid Democrat. But he started realizing that there were Republicans that you had to deal with as well, and, and he needed to work with them over time, and, and he did. And so, I mean, he, he built friendships across, across the whole gamut, uh, and active. I mean, he was amazing. So if you, if you ever got a chance to go, Sam was small, but if you ever got a chance to go to Washington, D.C. with Sam, it was an experience. It was unbelievable. I mean, he knew where he was going. He didn't have to look at map. He walked everywhere. Uh, it, I'll say he was a cheapskate, but he was a penny pincher. I mean, you know, if a hotel cost $110 a night, he'd find one where you'd get it for 109 you know. And so Sam was that kind of an individual. But he knew the hill like nobody else I've ever seen. I mean, he, he, he knew the underground parts of the hill, too. I mean, he didn't like to get out in the weather, so th there's a whole both subway system and then hallways between the House side, the Capitol, and the Senate side. Sam knew all of those underground uh, links, and he'd just take off through those tunnels and go from one side of the hill to the other side of the hill. Amazing. And he lived a long life, so he... 101. Connections for, you know... Long period of time. Politicians, I think. Yep. He, he, he recognized, too, that he, he was outliving his supporters. I mean, he outlived Magnuson, he outlived Jackson, you know. Uh, he, so the, the one that was constant was Rosalini, and Rosalini and he were the same age. And so Rosalini lived to 100 as well. So pretty good. Yeah. And what about Glenn Lee? So what sort of role was he like? Yeah, Glenn, Glenn Lee was a bulldog. I mean, he's a big, imposing man. Uh, the thing that I think the Tri City Herald should have done was kept his office as a mausoleum. I mean, his office was a piece of history by itself. I mean, he had pictures with presidents, he had pictures with governors, he had uh, memorabilia from from all over the place. If you if you asked Sam and Glenn the same question, you'd get two similar but different answers. I mean, who caused something to happen? You know, I mean it. 
I'll give you one story that is really unique. How did Battelle get here? Uh, Sam had a vision of how Battelle came. Glenn Lee had a vision of how Battelle came. Fred Albaugh, one of the lab directors, had a story about how Battelle came to be here. And Sherwood Fawcett, who became the first director of the lab, had a different story. I believe they're all correct, but they're different. <coughs> Each one takes credit in a different way. And so Sam, Sam claims full credit for bringing Battelle here. He was in a meeting in New York, and he knew that the lab was going to be bid out. He ran into Bert Thomas, who was the president of the Battelle and Sherwood Fawcett, and sold them on the idea of coming. That's Sam's story. If you listen to Sherwood Fawcett, Sherwood Fawcett said that, that uh, the president of the company actually was a graduate of the University of Washington, wanted to open a lab somewhere in the state of Washington, found out that, Bert, I mean, Bert Thomas found out that this lab was going to be bid, so Bert told Sherwood, go and bid on that and win it. So that two different sides of the same story. I don't know which one's right. Uh, so, yeah, you've uh, been connected with Hanford for, for quite a few years now um, and seen a lot of change mm -hmm. in the place. Now, obviously, one of the key changes was the mission of the place itself, yep. moved from production to cleanup. I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit in terms of how you, you saw that, the impact that had on the area and on Hanford itself. Ha happy to. That, you know, I'm going to connect it back to Sam a little bit. Mm -hmm. One of the changes that was major was going from AEC, Atomic Energy Commission, to a to an organization for a short period called ERDA, uh, which I forget now what that stands for. They were only in operation for a year and a half or so, and then now to DOE. Most of the new missions for the Hanford site didn't come from within the federal government. They came from the community. And so as the production reactors were being shut down, Sam and Glenn in particular saw that we needed to find new missions for Hanford. So one of the first ones was the Hanford Generating Plant, which was operated by Washington Public Power Supply System, but attached to N-Reactor. And so N-Reactor was the first dual purpose reactor in the United States. And, and the vision was it was going to last a long time because it was the newest one, and it produced 800 megawatts of power. And so, so Sam and Glenn said, let's get the HGP here because they won't shut. The United States wouldn't dare shut down a reactor that's producing 800 megawatts of power. So that was one of the early ones. But as, as you started to see the reactors come down, they looked for other missions. And one of the first ones was a thing called BWIP which is a basalt waste ice, everything has an acronym, but a basalt waste isolation project, which was actually in competition with both uh, Nevada and Texas to become the nation's repository. BWIP, that's a misnomer what I just said. BWIP was actually to study the geology of, of uh, basalt for a repository, but it wasn't going to be the repository. It was a study site. And if it worked, I mean, if it showed that it could work, then there would have been some other place on the Hanford site. They would have dug deep down into the, into the basalt and made a repository. So Def Smith, Nevada, Yucca Mountain, and here were one of the visions that Sam and Glenn had and wanted to become the repository for the nation. And all of a sudden, uh, there was a move in Congress that said, we're going to select one, and it's going to be Yucca Mountain, and so shut the other two down. And actually, BWIP, the Basalt Waste Isolation Project, was shut down within a period of two to four weeks. And there were hundreds of people that worked out there. When, when that shut down, Sam then went after the Clinch River Breeder Reactor Program, uh, the Breeder Reactor Program, and ended up getting FFTF. And so, I mean, there was a, there was certain things that happened in a sequence that he was always looking for that new mission, whatever it was. One example, the one that Sam loved to do and I stumble on every time, is Sam also heard that uh, MIT and some others were going after this deep space exploration project. And, and there were two sides to that at, at the time. One was SNAP, which is a space nuclear applications program. 
And the second side was what became LEGO, the Laser Interferometry Gravitational Wave Observatory. I can only do that once. <laughs> but Sam loved that one because he could spit it out. I mean, he, he had that one memorized and he loved to go into a congressional office and say, rather than LEGO, you know, and so, so Sam is the one that really pushed for that project as well. So, so always they had a vision of trying to capture new missions for Hanford, and it, it was never really, you know, the push never came from DOE or IRDA or AEC after the original mission. It all came from the community. And we're in competition with Oak Ridge, Idaho Falls, Savannah River, for those kind of things. So, yeah. Uh, I know one of the changes that's taken place, uh, you know, at Hanford since I've been here uh, is there are a lot fewer buildings on site now than yep. there were. Uh, and I wonder if you talk about that a little bit, and, you know, and, and what that means, you think, in terms yeah. of the history of the city. Oh. I'll start lightly and say it's a conspiracy. <laughs> the, the conspiracy is every building that I've ever worked in out there, with the exception of FTF, has been torn down. <laughs> So, so, you know, I, I think they're out to get, you know, at the top of Rattlesnake Mountain where the Nike Ajax building, they've been torn down. You know, uh, buildings in the, in the 300 area that I, I had offices in. So, so, what we're seeing today, though, is the success of cleanup, particularly along the river corridor. And, and I will say that the Department of Energy and the contractors have done an amazing job of cleaning up this site. Uh, when you look at the changes, particularly in the 300 area or the reactors themselves, I mean, the change is phenomenal. You know, it, it, I, I forget, I think there's something like 280 buildings have been taken off the site. And, you know, the landscape has changed, the big tall smokestacks are gone, uh, the water tanks that were out there are gone. Uh, I mean, it, the, the skyline has changed drastically, and they've done it, too, with an intent to try and return it to original habitat. So, you know, most of it is what's called brown fields, but, but they have done a tremendous job of actually recovering a lot of the vegetation, you know, and the original look of the land, with the exception that this was agricultural area. So it was, it's different. But that's a, that's a huge, huge change. And most of that's been in the last five years. I mean, that's, it's a different thing today than it was 1965. I mean, you, you just see it all over the place. So, okay. Um, so you've been, you've been giving tours here for yep. years. You know, I can't imagine how many tours you've led. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> a lot. Um, do you have a... A favorite place on site, uh, different places you stop for tours, or, or maybe even when you went out with the liquor. To, was there a place that you really? The the B reactor is unique, unique, unique. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is no place like B reactor. What when you go into B reactor and you realize that fifty thousand people were brought from all over the United States and some foreign countries, they didn't know what they were building. They didn't have computers. Uh, they didn't have portable radios, they didn't have portable phones, and they start to finish built B reactor in 11 months. That's just plain incredible. I mean, you look at the craftsmanship of doing that. Uh, the best analogy is still uh, from Jim Albaugh, who was the head of the Boeing uh, program for 787s. We took him on a tour of B Reactor and he came out and he said, this would be like trying to bring in 50,000 people, have them build their own community first because they had to have a place to live and, and eat and so on, and then tell them, build a 787, but you've got no computers to do it with. And you've got to buy all the materials and manufacture them. I mean, so B Reactor is unique, unique. And you know, I, I can't say enough about B Reactor. But, but there's a flip side too, and that is I've also become enamored with pre-1943. And when I think about that, it's really the city of White Bluffs. And the fact that there's still a ferry landing out there, there's a bank building out there, uh, there's sidewalks out there. I mean, you go out and when you're alone, I mean, you go out by yourself, 
And you can just visualize this community that used to exist. And then all of a sudden, they're moved away, and 50,000 people come in, you know, in a, in a period of weeks. I mean, you know, just a very short period of time. And they have to build a town, and then they start building things like B-reactor. I mean, you know, the, and, and to know it was all done really under the direction of a 36-year-old individual, you know, Corps of Engineers, it's unbelievable. I don't know of any 30, I know a lot of cocky 36-year-olds, but <laughs> I don't know anybody like Franklin Mathias to do the things that he did with 50,000 people. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. So, yeah, that, but favorite places, B reactor has got to be right, right there. Um, well, I think you and I could just go on talking about <laughs> it, probably. <laughs> I think we're close. <laughs> but I, uh, I do wonder, you know, if there's anything that we haven't talked about yet that you want to talk about, anything I haven't asked you about, any stories or anything you think was important that you wanted to the, the, There's a piece that has yet to be done. Bob, and that, that piece I've talked to several people about, and that piece is trying to capture either the individuals or the families of the people who were here prior to 1943. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it is extremely important for us as a community to find those people, identify them, bring them together, uh, allow them back out on the site for the first time. Uh, you know, I, I took the Bruggeman family uh, back out. That was the first time, and did this about three years ago. It was the first time they had been back since 1943. And to go, I mean, it, it's like anybody's heritage. You know, if you have a chance to go back and see where your parents or your grandparents, or you as a, as a child grew up, I mean, it, the vision is different. I mean, things are smaller, you know, but, but the feel of the place. So, so we need to find those people and give them credibility and standing so they have the opportunity to see their heritage. Uh, I, it, it turns out that exactly the same time as people were being moved off Hanford, the Japanese were being moved off of Bainbridge Island, exactly the same time. And they all had to be off by August of 1943. And, and in the case of the Japanese, uh, the federal government has actually uh, done some very nice things. I mean, they helped some of the families regain their, their land. Uh, they've, they've put up uh, displays of all kinds to say this is what happened. But here at Hanford, those families still are scattered around the United States, and they have very little to remember the site that they knew by. And when you think about, when you think about, and I'll use the Bruggemans because I know them the best, you think about uh, Bruggemans who had 1,400 acres. They had 640 acres, but they leased more. And they had uh, sheep, they had cattle, they had uh, working staff of something like uh, 10 to 20 people on and off, up and down. And they were given two weeks to get rid of all that stuff and move. And, and that's, I just, uh, that's, you know, that we've got to get that. We've got to capture that. We've got to help them. So that's the piece. How'd we do? <laughs> Did you guys go to sleep back there? <laughs> well, uh, thanks very much, Gary, for, yep. for sharing your stories. Like I said, I'm sure you and I could go on talking for quite a while. Uh, I, you know, and, and I recognize, too, you're really after the people who are here from pre-63, but 63 to, I don't know, 65 or so. But, you know, I, I'm a Johnny-come-lately, so... You know, I just, I look at it different. You know a lot of the history of the place, the story. Uh, there, there's pieces that are really pretty, pretty fun. So <laughs> there, there's some of the stories, honestly, that you probably will never hear because they have, they have dif different twist to them. Some point, not with an audience, I will tell you there's another side to the Apollo 11 moon rocks that got here. It's a very unique uh, story that only a couple people know, how they actually came to the site. I mean, it was it was tough. So. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Yeah.